Many times our prayer get us into a place that our obedience not willing to allow us to stay. You be praying for that more, you praying for more money, you praying for that freedom. They was going over to the promised land. See, when you're a slave, it don't cost you nothing. It don't cost you nothing. Freedom has a responsibility tied to it. And many people choosing to be slaves because they don't want to accept the responsibility of freedom. And see, you could be free physically and have the mentality of a slave. And many times, you, in order for the mentality to be reversed, God puts you in circumstances that causes to challenge your thinking. It challenges your previous way of life. It challenges how you used to get it done. Before, you wasn't, been, you wasn't led by nothing in, the, in Egypt, but now you have to be led by the cloud by day and the fire by night. And what happens when the Lord begins to take you out of bondage? He begins to lead you in a whole other way you've been led your whole life. Part of your test is being led this new way. Part of your test is being fed this new way. Your, all your needs being provided a whole nother way than what you was in your last season. Because you've been praying, Lord, ever lay, ever lay, <laughs> elevate me. Elevate me, Lord. Bring me up, Lord. I want to go higher, Lord. I want to go to the top, Lord. The top has responsibility tied to it. Are you willing to accept that? That's so good. Are you willing to accept the work of a good marriage? Are you willing to accept managing the money? The title of today's message is The Destructive Nature of a Complaining Spirit. Y'all get ready to hold on, hold on, hold on. The destructive nature of a complaining spirit. In this message, I'll be covering how complaining hinders our faith. I'll be covering differentiating complaining to God versus complaining about God. We will also cover how to process your complaints. How to process your complaints. Turn your Bibles to Philippians chapter 2, verses 14 through 16. I'll be reading from the New King James Version. This message is going to set some of you. This message is going to set all of us free. Amen. Hey, I ain't going to lie. We all need this one right here. Philippians chapter 2, verse 14 through 16 states, Do all things without complaining and disputing, that you may become blameless, harmless, children of God without fault. Look at the words say that right there. Look what he says. If you don't complain, this makes you faultless. Can you? Wow. He said, without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. Hold fast to the word of life, so I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I may not run in vain or labor in vain. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your holy written word. We thank you for giving us everything that pertains unto life and godliness. In Jesus' name, amen. Repeat after me. Say, I am a child of God. God. Everyone standing. Everyone standing. <clears throat> Let's go ahead and declare our expectation over this word. Amen? Amen. Repeat after me. I am a child of God. I am a, of God. I am a doer of his word. Of his and not just a hearer only. And not just a hearer only. The word of God is the foundation of my life. 
I am, co I am committed to believing and trusting in God's word. His lamp is, his word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I am rooted and grounded in him. His thoughts are my thoughts. His ways are my ways. I hate what he hates and I love what he loves. He is the source of my life. Y'all give God some praise. Hallelujah! Woo! Amen, 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 amen. The enemy is after your faith. He is after our faith. In one way, he uses us to dismantle the, the uh, momentum of our faith. He uses a complaining spirit to disrupt the momentum of our faith. Complaining is one way the enemy violates the law of faith that is at work in our prayer life as we are trusting the Lord. Here are some things that, 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 that is the root of complaining. The root of complaining always starts with a need. It always starts with an inconvenience. It always starts with a disruption of comfort, a disruption of peace. Amen? And so all complaining is derived from a need or from a want. And as believers, we have to learn how to process our needs and process our wants accurately. The Bible says, the Lord is our shepherd, we shall not want. He maketh us lie down, right, in green pastures, and he restores our soul. Whenever you're following the Lord, he is responsible for your needs and your wants. Amen? There are things that we are responsible for, and there are things that God is responsible for. Amen? And the things that you can't, you can't change, you need to be trusting the Lord. Amen? And so the Lord want to teach us how to operate in an attitude of gratitude. Amen? Amen. A lot of times we get in complaining because we want sympathy for what we're going through. We want somebody to recognize and feel sorry for us because we're going through it. Amen? Amen? And this don't feel good. And no one don't recognize my pain. And the reality is God is there with you. Amen? And God, sometimes you can feel lonely if you're waiting on somebody to feel sorry for you. And, and wait. you can feel um, like um, no one cares about you when, when no one is recognizing the pain and the suffering that you're going through. But I submit to you, God knows. Amen? One of the things that complaining does is what, it, 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 it causes us to be stuck in the natural. It causes us to be fixated on what's going on visibly. Amen? We get stuck in, and we get no, we start overemphasizing and having a uh, concentration on what we don't have instead of what we do have. We don't choose to remember the things that God has brought us out of. And so we, com we commence to complain about our, our present circumstances instead of moving to a place of thanksgiving and rejoicing. Amen? We all have something to be grateful about. Amen? There's always someone that has it worse than you. Amen? All right, let's cover this next point is complaining about God. And we're going to use the children of Israel as a reference point during this point because God had rescued the children of Israel out of Egypt, children of Israel out of Egypt and they was in bondage for 400 years. He, he sent the man of God, Moses, to come and declare their freedom to, the, to their captives. And Moses, God used Moses to humble Pharaoh, amen, and deliver his people. He um, caused Pharaoh to want to run after the children of Israel, 
after he has freed them and God has split the Red Sea. Amen. He used Moses to do it, though, and that's a point that you must understand. God just don't split the Red Sea because he wants to split it. He wants to use you to cooperate with him to split it. And a lot of times we're waiting on God to do something, and he, he's waiting on you to obey him. Because a lot of times when Moses and the children of Israel begin to complain to him, complain to Moses about what's going on, we, we about to be, they was complaining about the, the, the army was coming to get them. And Moses went on his knees and sought after God and said, what should I do? He said, get up from here and use what I've given you. Mm, 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 mm. We waiting on God to give us something. A lot of times he has already equipped us with the rod. Amen? And so, three days later, the children of Israel was out, they was without water in the desert, and God had set them free from, he had provided himself as protector, and now he's provided himself as the provider in the wilderness. Amen? And so now, uh, we in Exodus chapter 16, verse 2 through 3. Then the whole congregation of, the, of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said to them, Oh, that we had died in the hand, by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by pots of meat and when we ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out here in the wilderness to kill the whole assembly with hunger. Let's look at this right here. The whole, sometimes in our life, the Lord has set us free, right? And when we begin to follow him, sometimes he leads us to the wilderness or he leads us to dry places. Amen. I mentioned this many times, but we're going to go in today. He, he leads us in the wilderness. And he's leading us in the wilderness because, first of all, he has to keep his promise to the children of Israel. They, they would have the promised land. Amen. But secondly, he was responding to their cry to be free. Sometimes your cry to be free will lead you to a place where it seems like you're going backwards. And what happens a lot of times when we, when our cry to be free, the Lord begins to lead us so, he, so we may trust him. That's what the wilderness represents. It represents a place where if you don't trust the Lord, you're not going to make it. Because the Lord is trying to strip away all that you used to depend on. Amen? And so when you start itching over into freedom, and start itching over into um, following the Lord, sometimes where he leads you seems like a worse place than where you was. And if you're not careful in what he's doing, he's confronting that slavery mentality you have. What he does is he leads you to a place to confront the thing in your life that's causing you to not depend on the Lord. So what did that look like? The enemy will start making you feel like it was better where you was. He'll make you feel like it's better to go back in that relationship that you cried to get out of. And sometimes we'll have a romanticized version of the past, right? This is called nostalgia. It's a romanticized version of the past where you want to go back to bondage. See, we forget about all, when, when, when the enemy start working on us like this, we forget about the bad and we only focus, focus on the good. Man, we had meat, we had plenty of food, but you was a slave. Why would you want to go back? See, sometimes we don't forget about that though, right? We only focus on the, and it was a good old days, but you was a slave. And you remember those nights of crying to get out of it? And finally, the Lord set you free, and you get in a top, tough spot with him where he's teaching you how to trust him, and you want to go back to how it was. 
And the Lord is doing it on purpose to teach you how to trust him. Amen. Many times we have complaints that are legitimate. Look, look, they wanted water, right? They needed water. They needed food, right? Amen. But sometimes complaining to God and complaining about God are two very different things. Amen. Amen. Complaining isn't trusting God. Complaining is the language of fear. Every action we take is either out of fear or out of love. Amen? Fear is the opposite of faith. Fear will attract any information to justify its existence in your mind. And when you're in fear... Many times, fear is communicating to you your future. It's trying to tell you what's going to happen. Is you going to end in this? This going to happen? You going to lose everything? That's going to happen? Is you not going to make it? God ain't going to come through for you. This, this stuff don't work like that. You know, it's going to be just like you start seeing flashes of the past. You start seeing flashes of the past, and it's trying to get you to believe and trust in a reality that Jesus didn't give you. Fear, when you're operating in fear and saying statements of fear with it, through, through the element of complaining, you believe in God don't really love you. You believe in that God really, he's not going to come through for you just like he said he would. We stop trusting in the initial command he told us to go. It's similar to when Jesus told the disciples they go going to the other side. And then a storm came. And it seems like they was going down, right? And the Bible talks about how they was gripped with fear. And when fear grips you, you have to remind yourself of what he initially told you in the first place. So when fear comes, you should be saying, no, Jesus said we're going to the other side. Instead of, what are we going to do? The enemy is, designs it on purpose, and God allows it to influence what you see. What you see has to be challenged. Your faith, we are required to walk by faith and not by sight. We are required to walk by believing and not by seeing. What are you, believe, what are you going to believe when everything looks like you're not going to make it? What is it that he said that you need, to re, you need to respond to life with? Amen? Complaining is the language of fear. There's a big difference of complaining about God. Many times, in the, when, the, when the children of Israel was coming out, when they complained to Moses, the Bible talks about how they complained to Moses and Aaron all the time. But God saw them complaining to him. Because Moses and Aaron were just doing what God had told them to do with the people. And when the people were complained about that, they were actually complaining against God. And they was complaining about God. And we do this all the time. We pray for that new job. <laughs> you pray for that new job, and that person that you didn't like on your old job is on your new job. <laughs> Y'all remember that? Same type of attitudes that was on the old job. You found out. It was, it was on new. And God knew that it was going to be like that. He knew those folks was on your job, right? You pray for that husband. You pray for that spouse. You pray for that church. Many times our prayer get us into a place that our obedience not willing to allow us to stay. You be praying for that more. You praying for more money. You praying for that freedom. They was going over to the promised land. See, when you're a slave, it don't cost you nothing. Come on. It don't cost you nothing. Freedom has a responsibility tied to it. 
And many people choosing to be slaves because they don't want to accept the responsibility of freedom. And see, you could be free physically and have the mentality of a slave. And many times, you, in order for the mentality to be reversed, God puts you in circumstances that causes to challenge your thinking. It challenges your previous way of life. It challenges how you used to get it done. Before, you wasn't, you wasn't led by nothing in, the, in Egypt, but now you have to be led by the cloud by day and the fire by night. And what happens when the Lord begins to take you out of bondage? He begins to lead you in a whole nother way you've been led your whole life. Part of your test is being led this new way. Part of your test is being fed this new way. Your, all your needs being provided a whole nother way than what you was in your last season. Because you've been praying, Lord, ever lay, ever lay, <laughs> elevate me. Elevate me, Lord. Bring me up, Lord. I want to go higher, Lord. I want to go to the top, Lord. The top has responsibility tied to it. Are you willing to accept that? That's so good. Are you willing to accept the work of a good marriage? Are you willing to accept managing the money? Jesus, you got to help me this morning. We pray our place, we pray our life into a place where we have to trust the Lord. But many of us complain when we get to that place because it's not what you thought it was. Right? And it's like that on purpose. It's never, everything you see is going to change. The Bible says guaranteed. It's going to change. Everything we see is going to change. Nothing stays the same. Nothing. So you might as well start trusting in and relying on something that doesn't change, and that's his word. Amen? Been around a long time. All right, let me explain to y'all a concept I don't think I ever taught you all, is what is what is God's anger? The Bible says in Numbers chapter 11, verse 1, it says, Now we, now when the people complained, it displeased the Lord. For the Lord heard it, and his anger was aroused. So fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed some in the outskirts of the camp. What is God's anger? Because God's anger is not like yours. If that was the case, I would have been done got burned up. You would have got burned up. We all be burned up right now. Amen. God's anger isn't like yours. Say, teach me, Lord Jesus. Anytime you want to know something about God, humble yourself and ask him to show you. Amen. Don't assume you already know. Most people assume they already know things and they, it locks them out of revelation for them to learn. All right. Complaining like the children of Israel did in the wilderness stirs up God's anger. Amen. God's anger is this. When we don't allow him to be all he wants to be towards us. It frustrates him. Because he wants to do more than what we are allowing him to do. And sometimes when we complain, that is voicing your fears, especially when we do it to men, especially when we do it to leaders, and especially when we're talking about church leaders, this causes God to not be able to use the things he's placed in your life to bless you. Our choices hinder God from doing more than he would love to do, and that angers him. It angers him to have to let you reap what you sow. So if you sow to the flesh, it's, it, it frustrates him that he has to allow what you have sown to come and reap a harvest towards you that he didn't plan for your life. 
It angers me when my children refuse to acknowledge and take heed to my word and go out and bust their head about stuff that I know I taught them their whole life. That frustrates me because I can't bless disobedience. It frustrates me because I can't be who I want to be towards them because they won't let me. So if I teach my son about fire and I'm telling him, son, the fire is hot. See, you see how it's doing this piece of meat in this pan? It is hot. It will do your finger like this. It will do your arm like this. It is hot. Right. And I teach my son about fire. And two days later, my son go in there and touch the fire. I get angry. Why? Because he didn't take heed to what I taught him. And now he has experience of pain that my word was, was given to him to avoid. And so the Lord is saying no to that spouse, no to different things that you want, no to that job seem like it's going to pay more. The Lord said no to different things that you want. And when we bust our head and get out there without him, we want to complain. Well, if you remember, he told you beforehand. Amen. How many of y'all ignored, ignored the Lord at one point in time in your life? I know I have. And I regret it. I regret it. Amen. So complaining limits God. This is so good. Listen to this. Complaining limits God in your life. Go to Psalms chapter 78, verses 41 through 43. I'll be reading from the Passion Translation, and it states, And again and again they limited God, preventing him from blessing them. Look at that word right there, boy. Preventing him from from blessing them. Continually they turned back from him and provoked the Holy One of Israel. They fought, they forgot his great love and how he took them by the hand and, the, and with redemption kiss he delivered them from their enemies. They disregarded all the epic signs and marvels they saw when they escaped from Egypt's bondage. For they forgot the judgment of plagues that set them free. Listen to that. And many times we get into, we get into, we, 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 we cry out for deliverance and the Lord leads us on a path of, uh, to the promised land and we get in tough spaces and begin to forget how he set us free in our previous seasons. And so as we transition, God's anger isn't like ours. He has much patience with us. Amen. And so it's frustrating to God that we refuse to accept and believe for our future. Let's go to our next point. Complaining about God versus complaining to God. Now, this is where we're getting into the element of complaining that is allowed and God, and God also prefers. Amen. And most of the time, when we get into this realm of complaining, now, now this is powerful now. Before we complaining about our situation, we complain about what's going on, we complain to our aunties and our uncles, we complain to our friends and our family members. And the scripture says here, Psalms 142, verses 1 through 3, it says, I cry out to the Lord with my voice. With my voice to the Lord, I make my supplications. I pour out my complaint before him. So there is, a, there is a way that God desires for us to approach him about what we're going through in our life. The children of Israel would complain to Moses and Aaron, and Moses would go back and tell God, what they saying. 
and God would give Moses the answer, right? And all the while, God desired that the children of Israel run to God like Moses was. God desires to have a relationship with his people as a whole. I am an example, I am a representative, but I am not the way to your God. Amen? Amen? He is your God just like he is mine. Amen? And God desires that you go to him just like I do. I got my own problems, right? I do intercede for you, I do cover you in prayer, but I do have, you have a relationship with God just like I do. Amen? So he says, when my spirit was overwhelmed within me, then you knew my path in the way in which I walk. I have secretly set, they have secretly set a snare for me. This is the same person that says, I will bless the Lord at all times. And his praise will con what? continually be in my mouth, right? David had a way with God where he had a relationship with him where he can, can voice the things that was bothering him. I mean, y'all, that's how I talk to God, right? Instead of running to your bestie, instead of running to your family members and telling them all about your troubles, God desires that you run to him and tell him about your troubles. So there's a way we can process our complaints. And this is it. We run to him about how we feel. Lord, I'm about to snap and go off. Lord, this is bothering me, Lord Jesus. I don't like what they said. I don't like what they did. I don't like how this is, humi it feels humiliating when I'm about to lose my house, Lord. It feels humiliating when they talking about me because I'm a Christian on my job, Lord. It feels humiliating when uh, my car keep breaking down every week, Lord God. This is what you said I can have, Lord. You said you will supply all my needs according to your riches and glory, Lord God. Lord God, you called me here to this church to submit to, these past to, the, submit to this pastor and the leadership here of this church, Lord. God, you call me, and when they say and do this, this bothers me, Lord Jesus. I just want to snap and slap somebody, Lord God. This is how I feel, God. The Bible says, come boldly to the throne of grace that you obtain mercy for your failures. The reason you don't come when you complain so much because we're not ex exhausting and l giving God all our troubles. The Bible says right here, cry out to the Lord with, he said, I cry out to the Lord with my voice. God desires to hear you, not just, he, just, he listen, we have to come out of praying with our thoughts. You need to open up your mouth, right? We need to cry out to him. This is, why y'all so loud? Well, it's, it's so many references, especially in Psalms where they talk about cry out to the Lord your God. Shout unto the Lord your God, right? Shout for joy, right? So there are, there are times where the Lord desires, not times, he want to hear you. He want to hear you with your voice. He, the reason it's, it's challenging sometimes for us to come into a place of really voicing our prayers because it challenged our faith and what we see. When we begin to talk into the air, we're talking like somebody, someone is actually there, and it is. But it's challenging because you can't see it. Amen? And so God desires, and he want to hear you. He wants your supplication to be made known unto him. Amen? So how do you process your complaints? Well, we, first of all, we run to him. The Bible says, uh, cast all your cares upon the Lord, for he cares for you. How do you actually do that? Well, he says, if you abide in my word and my word abide in you, you can ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. Right? So we process our complaints by first voicing them to God in a prayerful state, not to man, not to, not to your bestie. None of those things are going to produce 
the um, faith. Amen. So what's that's how we need to process it. We need to start there. Then the Bible says that when we come to him and Mark 11, verse 24 says, therefore, I say, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. Amen. Amen. So by complaining to God or voicing our complaints to God, getting in faith with our complaints, going to the one that can, that can fix them and show you. If you look at the pattern of Moses, he ran to God when they complained, and God showed Moses every time how to overcome. This is how we overcome in our life. Lord, what do you, the most important thing that I can teach you is how to hear from God. Because now you can run to him, the one who knows everything with your life, and he can give you instructions on how to respond to what's going on in your life. Amen? God's actions towards you are always good. Always good. God's actions towards you are always good. Amen? There's not a time that God doesn't know what he is doing. And this is how we should process our faith. Once we come to him, we, then we go into a place of believing that he heard us, right? What are the scriptures that ties to when, we, when he hears us? The Bible says that the prayers of the righteous avail of much, right? And his ears are open to our prayers, Amen. So this is the state. When we go into a state of releasing our worries and our cares to God and releasing our complaints to God, we have to believe that he heard us. And if we believe that he heard us, how do we respond? The Bible says if we believe we receive, we can have whatever. We, believing you have already gotten the answer to your prayer. How do you respond if you receive something from God? Or if you receive something from anyone, how do you respond? Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is what we should shift into to avoid complaining about when God is going to do it. That's why we worship him. That's why we go into a place of faith concerning what we see. Man, the Lord is changing my life. Boy, the Lord is changing this. Lord, the Lord is, he is taking this away from me. He is, he is healing my body, praise God. Why? Because I pray, praise God, and he hears me. And I'm responding to life. How, what is life telling you? Life is going to exhibit the opposite of what you pray for. That it's going to challenge that what you pray for is really real. And so you have to get to a place of faith saying, no, Jesus is my Lord. He's my master. He always got to come through for me. Praise God. He's the creator of the heavens and the earth, and he's living on the inside of me. Praise God. I might feel alone, but I ain't alone. Amen. I might feel like this, but I ain't like that. Amen. I might look like I'm broke, but I got more than enough because he is my, he is the God that take care of me. How do we respond to life? We respond to life based off what he said, not based off what I see, not based off how I feel, not based off what is this plan in my bank account. Amen. I have to respond to life based off, and this is how you process your complaints. And so you move into a place of thanksgiving about what you pray for. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you stay into that place until he show you what to do with the next thing. Because eventually he'll show you if we don't mess it up with the complaint. <laughs> How can we mess it up with a complaint? How does complaining affect our faith? <clears throat> complaining is the manifestation of being double-minded. One day we want to leave, the next day we want to stay. Double-minded means you have two, you are, you are, you have two minds. You have two way of, you have um, two ways of thinking. When we go to prayer, we believe and we come out of prayer, praise God, I'm believing, I'm believing. And soon as life displays something else, we say, man, when, when, what? I'm tired of this. And when we go into complaining, 
We just disregarded our faith that we initiated when we prayed. Because now we're allowing what we see to totally come against the momentum of our faith. So it's the manifestation of being double-minded. And the Bible says, let not that man think he's going to receive anything from the Lord. Amen. When we pray our needs, we pray our needs, right? And we say, Lord, we believe and we're trusting in you. How does complaining affect the momentum of that prayer? I don't know what I'm going to do. Well, you did what you know to do, which was trust the Lord. And until he gives you instructions, we need to keep our words lined up with what we pray for. Or what happens is we start believing something other than what we initiated in prayer. Amen. So the Lord, sometimes this is very tricky because um, you have to learn laws of faith. You have to learn with the heart. Man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. You have to learn the laws of life and death on your tongue. You have to learn these principles. You have to learn if you shall not doubt and believe in your heart and speak to the mountain, it shall be removed. The Bible says, shall not doubt. What, are those, uh, shall, what shall not doubt in your heart means? There are things that can come out your mouth that reveals doubt. Amen? And so I even take my doubts to God and saying, Lord, dang, how can I believe? Because how can I not be so moved by what I see, God? I even take, like the disciples did, Lord, help my unbelief. Teach me then. Show me then. I don't know, Lord. God, help me to not violate these laws of faith, God. You know, because this is why you need spiritual teachings and not just knowledge. And you need rhema to give you the specifics. The rhema word give you the specifics on how to overcome, right? God told Moses to strike the rock, right? That, that, wasn't, that ain't logos, right? That's, rev, that's, that's, that's specific to, to the condition that you're going through. You need to be open to obeying Jesus after you pray, right? I remember there was a time where before I was, when I was in business, and I'm praying for weeks, 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 and saying, Lord, you're my provider. Lord, you're my provider. Lord, I trust in you. I trust in you. And then he started leading me to lawn care. And I remember one day I was broke for a long time, like two months. And I just a long, I was broke. And Jesus, I was putting a treatment in my yard to keep the weeds out because of HOA rules and stuff. And Jesus said, get you another bag and go up the street and offer this services to those up the street. Right, go knock on the doors and offer what you're doing on your yard and give it to somebody up the street. And I remember, I get to about to the fourth house down from my house. This is embarrassing too, man. This is so embarrassing. <laughs> so I get to the, but I ain't care. So I, but I get to the house and um, I said, man, I'm offering these services. It's like February, right? I'm offering these services and, and dude gave me $20 to do it. I went home and I put the $20 on the counter and this is when the Lord told me, the money's out there. It's out there. You just got to go get it. And once I found out it was outside my house, I stayed outside my house. <laughs> I told my kids, I said, guys, listen, I'm doing it the hard way. Go to school. You know, I mean, we make good money, but there's still easier ways to make money than what I'm doing. Amen. Amen. So complaining, how does complaining affect your faith? Well, your statements of doubt that contradict what you expected. So good. Your statements of doubt that is contradicting what you expected. You need to learn this revelation, too. This is so good. All right. The Bible says that the angels of the Lord hearken to the voice, 
the voicing and the voicing of God's word, right? So Jesus taught me that there are angels of light and there are angels of darkness. Angels do God's bidding. All they do is respond to the authority of the king, right? But you still have angels of darkness out here. And their job is to bring to pass all the doubt statements you have. They still obeying just in darkness because they've been converted. When Satan convinced them of uh, and, and, and a third of heaven fell, right? So we have to be aware of statements of doubt. I believe that we can, conf- we can, we can accept the reality, yeah, it's, I'm broke, you know, according to what I see in the bank account. I am sick. It is, I am in pain. I confess the reality and the truth of the reality of what's going on, um, but it's not the final word, right? We don't, we're not supposed to live in the reality of what it is and how your parents and your children and your uh, family, you see the same patterns in your family from this, this, this generation to the next. There is, a, there is a process where you begin to say enough is enough, and you begin to believe against what you see. You hope against hope. Pastor Nate last week talked about how uh, hope is a firm expectation. How can we hope against hope? Well, the physical reality has an expectation for your life, and then you have God's word that has an expectation for your life, right? And so we begin to hope against the reality of the physical expectation that this world has to offer. And this hope that we have is stimulated off of what God said. Amen? And so we begin to hope against hope that way. All right? So another way that it affects our faith is complaining is another way of saying, I want to stay in the wilderness. Y'all got to get out of it. (laughs) Complaining is another way of saying, I would like to stay in the wilderness, God. Receiving God's promises has a lot to do with you being grateful for the process. So sometimes what's what's challenging, we begin to want to know when, and we get into these timelines, and we start looking at how old we are. We start looking at and comparing our lives to other people, and and these things cause us to get um, it causes us to get discontented, and then we begin to make choices to help God out, right? And so we don't want to, we always want to stay in an attitude of gratitude because we don't, we, we don't want to become weary in well-doing. When you become weary in well-doing, that's when you, are, you have become impatient with God's timeline. You have become, you have, begin, you have gotten to a place of coveting. This is so good. See, coveting is about when, coveting, when you begin to want, you begin to want, you begin to want, and we should take our wants to God, right? And we should trust that God will bring what we want to pass. The Bible says that we are to uh, hunger and thirst after righteousness. The Bible says that we seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added. All the things you want will chase you. You don't have to chase what you want. If you're chasing what you want, that's, you're already out of order, right? It's revealed that you're not trusting when you're chasing what you want. You're not trusting like you should. There's a waiting where we're just satisfied and content with godliness. There's years where, where we were just we just were satisfied with God. Amen. And then the Lord just take you, He take you on up. And then you just still be satisfied with God. You just enjoy the things of this world. You don't let them control you, right? I don't have to get in debt during Christmas, right? Why? Because, listen, they, these kids, if they want stuff that I'm not able to have to give them, guess what I say? Guess what we say, baby? What we say? You better go pray. <laughs> listen, he'll do it. He'll do it if, they, if you teach them how to believe. 
and teach them. You don't, who's, this is so good. Who said you got to buy them everything they want? Who said that? You know that ain't true because God don't even do you like that. He be having you wait. Right? He never, he never did tell you to be there all things to them. Especially, hey, listen, I got their needs covered and I give them a couple things, but they need to get on their knees and trust the Lord. I ain't playing. Listen, if I don't have the money, I ain't got the money. I can't get in pride, right? I, I, and then sometimes, even if you do have it, see, you think, listen, God, he, he owns it all, right? But do he give it to us all at once? No, we have to trust him. He, we waiting. I'm waiting how to see the, I'm seeing how they do with the $40 pair of shoes <laughs> before I buy them the Jordans. Why would I go buy them $200 pair of shoes and then they, they, got, they got holes in the stuff that I bought last week? Ain't no way. Listen, I'm buying thrift stuff until they come to a place of responsibility. <laughs> I'm not going and buying no new pants and you just put two holes in it. I just bought these pants. You work hard to back for that money, right? We, I'll buy some thrift stuff. Amen? I want to do, and it's good that you want to do for them, right? It's good that you want to be there for them, but don't get it in the ditch. There's a ditch that we can get into as parents thinking that we have to provide them with everything when they should be good with what they got, their needs. God, oh, this is so good. God will trust you in the lack to see what you will do in abundance. Come on now. He'll test you with a little to see what you do with a lot. This is why he was taking them through the wilderness. And they couldn't even handle the, the lack. Boy, you about to teach me something, boy, Jesus. So you don't want to try to skip your curriculums. It's not good that you skip class. A lot of people should be here today, but you chose to show up. This is the answers to your test you're going to face Monday through Friday, Monday through Saturday. I'm telling you, you should treat these moments as if it's, there, there, are, there, there are answers that's being spilt out over this poor pit for your life. So that you can overcome, because it, I'm not that smart, right? I'm not that smart, guys. Don't look at me, please. Don't look at me. But you can take the, 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 the teachings that the Lord has given to you and just call to your, this your church, this, and you can begin to take this at home and begin to process these things and apply them in your life. Amen? Amen. So as believers, we get to a place where we, we begin to trust the Lord. Uh, and we allow uh, Lord Jesus to teach us how to apply and when to apply these truths. Amen. All right, let's go to some practical things. How long? That's right. That can't be right, bro. All right. Listen to this. Seven ways to stop complaining. Get in faith about your life. Amen. Amen. Get in faith means start trusting. Take God's word and in everything that you see that's lacking, have a word tied to it. Amen? Learn to accept the changes. Be flexible. <laughs> this is so good. Learn to be flexible when God changes things up. Because many times we're going to complain and when things change and we come out of our comfort zone and it's, it's not as it was. Amen? Focus on the things that you do have instead of on the things that you don't have. Amen? Distance yourself from fellowshipping with negative people. This is very important. Everybody's not hearing this message that you're hearing right now, that guy. They don't understand principles of faith like you being taught for years. Remember, y'all been coming to church for years. Some people ain't came to church once. They don't understand principles of faith. Right? So don't, I didn't say don't go around them. I said fellowship. Amen? Distancing yourself from fellowshipping with negative people. Stand in thanksgiving concerning the things that you are trusting God for. Learning to just always thank in him. And then, this is number one, allow what Jesus done for you on the cross 
be the greatest thing that you are grateful for. Don't be so fixated on the promise of God that you ain't even happy that you're saved. You know, what I, what I don't like it when we start talking about the promise of God and then people just, they'll, they'll use the promises of God to try to manipulate God to get what they want. That ain't what it is. God is still, we don't use the arm of the flesh to get what we want, right? We trust him. But our greatest, our greatest shout and thankfulness comes from what he done for us and accomplished for us on the cross. That causes us to get our greatest joy, not a new car, not a new house, not another husband, none of those things. None of that, other, that stuff only lasts temporary. The only thing that lasts is what he's done for you on the cross. You can always go back and rejoice as much as you want because of what he's done. It's never going to change. It's a fixed truth from now and eternity that you can always fall back on. It's what he done for you on the cross. The car is going to fade. Your wife is going to get old. Your husband going to get old. Things are going to change. What you see is going to change. Don't place your faith in what you see. Amen? Solely. Enjoy these things, but my faith is, my joy comes from, not from my kids acting right, not from people always congratulate me and being there for me is what Jesus done for me is what's going to keep me in the, in the same state while I'm here on earth. Amen? All right. Stand, learning to adapt. Learning to adapt. The last thing I, I want you to do is don't allow, don't allow self pity. All these things that keep self, don't allow self pity to cause you to want others to feel sorry for you. The Lord has sent people there that could be compassionate about what you're going through, but desiring that someone see me and feel sorry for me is a trap. It's a trap. Because if you're looking for that, and it don't come, then the enemy can convince you that those who do love you don't really love you because they're not running to your self-pity. Amen. It's a trap. Complaining is bad for your health. Lastly, come on, Julius. Actually, stay right there, Julius. You look good, bro. We're going to do something different for uh, altar call. Don't worry about it. Um, Antonio, give me that instrumental that we had on the, uh, the impartation Sunday. Complaining is bad for your health. When you complain, you increase your levels of cortisol, also known as stress hormone. Chronically high levels of cortisol can lead to a variety of health problems, including increased risk of depression, digestive problems, sleep issues, higher blood pressure, and even increase the risk of heart disease. Stress is the number one problem, number one killer. Stress is. It's not heart disease. It's not anything else. It's stress. It's not being able to process stress. Amen? And so complaining has a lot to do with that because it actually, this is so good. Listen to this. The speaking center of the brain is over your nervous system. So your words can affect your nerves. Your words can affect your nerves. It can absolutely affect how you feel. And so as we learn about the body, because the Bible, the Bible been said this. Now, doctors are saying, they're, they're picking up on this. But the Bible says that your, 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 um, your tongue is like the rudder to a ship. It controls. It's a very little thing that controls the whole body. Amen. In closing, complaining absolutely destroys your faith. And the destructive nature of complaining hinders the progression and the momentum of 
your, what you're expecting God for. Amen? And the Lord began to have mercy on us when we are children, right? There are things that children get away with that is allowed, right? But when the Lord really start growing you up and you start maturing in him, there are things that he allowed you to do when you was a child that he is not going to allow you to do as you become an adult in him. Amen. There are things that I let my son do when he was three that I don't let him do today. All right. And God does these things because he is trying to develop you. I believe that he is in his mercy to allow you to grow. But then when we begin to grow up and mature in him, we have to be exposed to spiritual concepts and the law of laws of faith. Amen. And so Jesus desire that we grow up into him. And we begin to speak our faith. Um, and I'm so grateful that we can run to him with our complaints. Amen. Go ahead, Antonio. Everyone standing. Everyone standing. 